Hey everybody out there, uh, today's Groovy DSP tutorial is going to be about Foyer theory. Uh, and it's essentially going to be about the concept that everything that you hear is can be broken down into sine waves. Uh, first we're going to go over some groundwork, and this is kind of on the road to building better oscillators that don't distort or alias. Uh, first, I wanted to answer a question that a, a friend asked about the last lesson. And he said, he asked, if if aliasing is around Nyquist, how come we hear frequencies that can be so far below Nyquist from this aliasing? You know, what's really happening here? Okay, so I didn't mention foldover. Uh, a lot of times it's called foldover, and that's because if this is Nyquist, right? Um, you could represent a frequency here, or here, or whatever, it doesn't matter. But if you try to go above Nyquist, let's say you want to represent a frequency here, it will actually pop up symmetric over here, centered, you know, flipped around this Nyquist frequency. You know, when I represent this, it's going to pop up over here, and, and that's what's making that nasty sound. Um, and that's also kind of why, if you're familiar with ring mod, why it sounds a little bit like that too. Um, okay, so I hope that covers kind of uh, some of why or what we're hearing when we hear aliasing. Uh, you know, makes it more concrete, maybe. Uh, but we're going to talk now about Fourier theory. Okay, so I mentioned that everything that we hear can be accurately broken down into a sinusoid. A sinusoid is a sine or cosine wave, or some combination of the two. So think of it like a sine wave at any phase. So here's an example. So let's draw some axes, right? Here's your sine wave. Starts at zero. Here's a cosine wave, right? Uh, the only difference between these two is, uh, well, I drew these at different frequencies, but the only difference between these two really is that uh, one starts at one spot in the phase and one starts at another spot, you know? So what you're seeing over here cor correlates to uh, over here in a cosine. Um, yeah, that's zero on the rise, right? Uh, but you know, what would you call a sine wave or a cosine wave that starts anywhere? Uh, you know, let's say you wanted to start it, um, you know, here, right? So you're starting it right over here. Uh, that's a flipped cosine, but, you know, we can just dispense with these names, right? Um, and we can just call these a sinusoid. Um... And that basically is a sine or cosine wave at any phase. We, we don't care. And uh, you also find out later um, that you can make any phase by combining, adding the sine and the cosine together. It's, it's a pretty funky wave. It has some really neat uh, properties. Okay. So we've got that definition taken care of. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about pitch harmonics and timbres. So you're going to hear a lot about harmonics, but what really is a harmonic? Okay, so what a harmonic is, is one of the single sinusoids that make up one of the pitched, pitched sounds that we hear. Um, so here's an example. Let's say you're hearing um, a pitch at 400 hertz. That's a middle A. Uh, unless it's a very boring instrument, you know, a pure sine wave, you're not just hearing this. You're hearing frequencies at probably at 600, at 800, at, you know, um, 1200, you know, her, you know, et cetera. Going, going down the line, each one of these, you might notice a pattern here, is separated by... Um, Wait a minute, I, I messed this up. This is, <laughs> I'm adding 200, I meant to add 400. This is not a 400 hertz. Um, actually, this is an interesting point. Um, so these are 200 hertz apart. 200 hertz. This is the pitch of your sound, what the spacing is of these harmonics. What's interesting is that even though this starts, it's a complete accident, but I, I can use this to explain something else. Um, even though this starts, the lowest pitch in the sound is 400 hertz. You're act, you're going to perceive this as a 200 hertz tone that just happens to be missing this, um, because the pitch really comes from the spacing between harmonics. But yeah, the spacing between the harmonics 
between these signs that make up the sound, sine waves, uh, that your brain decodes that as pitch. That's what we call pitch. Um, the loudness of each one of these describes the timbre. It describes whether you're hearing a flute or a trumpet or a violin. And, you know, so, some things, you know, if you ran it through a chorus and it became this fat sound, um, you might smear these a bit, but generally speaking, they're going to be these spikes around these, you know, even through a chorus or a reaver or whatever, um, around, around these humps around the... Uh, these harmonic frequencies. Now I want to show you a few things on the oscilloscope. I want to show you how this works in practice because I said that we're going to use this to make a better oscillator. So what better thing is there to do than to make classic uh, wave shapes with this technique, but it's by adding sine waves together. Because it proves in the pudding, right? You know, theory doesn't do you any good unless you can apply it. Okay, so what we're going to do is make a square wave by using this technique that we're talking about, just adding sinusoids up. And the way you get a square wave is by adding every other harmonic. So you'll have the first harmonic, the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, and so on. And that's one important characteristic. The other important thing to remember about a square wave is that the uh, amplitude of these harmonics falls off. It ramps down at one over the harmonic number. So, you know, if you're the first harmonic, you'll be at full blast. If you're the third harmonic, you'll be at one third of the amplitude of your first harmonic. Um, if you're at the fifth harmonic, you'll be at one fifth amplitude. And that fall off is a big characteristic of what makes the square wave the square wave. If you wanted to, say, make a saw wave instead, you would add every harmonic in, not just the odd-numbered ones. If you wanted to make a triangle wave, it would be like a square wave, except it falls off a lot faster. Okay, so let me hit play on this obvious freeze frame, and let's see how this goes. Making the square wave. Watching it again in slow motion, you can see the sides get built up more and more as you add more and more uh, sinusoids into the mix. The more you add, the closer and closer you get to that perfect square wave. Now, you might notice that there's still some wiggles in this waveform, and I believe those are all above your hearing or your audio equipment's ability. There's another cool thing I want to show you, and that has to do with phase. So, okay, what do you think this sounds like? After all, it doesn't look like a square and it doesn't look like a saw. So let's go back to the oscilloscope and see. Okay, so what gives? That looks nothing like a square wave, but it sounds just like one. Well, it has the same harmonic content as a square wave. And the reason it looks different is because I smeared the phases of every sinusoid contained in that signal, in that wave. So, you know, the square wave is traditionally built up out of sine waves, and that gives you the square shape. But if you build it, say, out of cosine waves or something else, uh, they will all have different phase relative to each other, and that'll give you a different shape. So you can see here that you can't judge a waveform based on its shape. You have to look at the harmonic content, what harmonics are present in the sound. Another way of saying it is the same shape will give you the same harmonics every time, but the same harmonics, uh, if you don't take phase into account, uh, will not always give you the same shape. The shape depends on the phase, the phases of the individual sinusoids. So how do you know how many sine waves you can use to build up a sound. How many will fit? Well, that's that's easy. So let's say you have, going back to the 400 hertz, actually let's make it easier, let's make it 800 hertz. Let's make it 1,000 hertz. 1,000 hertz, that's good. Um, that's easy to calculate, that's a really high pitch. <laughs> um, I, I'm very bad at arithmetic, by the way. Uh, I'm okay at, at math when it's theoretical. I, I, I still count on my fingers, so, you know, if, if you ever feel like you're bad at math, you, that, and that because of that you can't grasp this stuff, um, I, I assure you I'm probably worse at math than anyone watching this. Uh, let's say your Nyquist frequency is at 10,000 hertz. 
Um, and you want to know, starting at 1000 hertz, how many of these fit into the range from 1000 to 1000, skipping 1000 at a time because that's our base pitch. Um, well, how many 1000s go into 10,000? That's, that's what you have to solve. Um, so I hope this is straightforward enough, um, and that, that will produce a sound as sharp as possible without distortion at that pitch. You can't sample this and slide it around because you're sliding everything with it, and you're going to go right into Nyquist. Uh, but for a single pitch, this is an additive way of generating that pitch. Now, we need more efficient ways of doing this, or doing something similar, or at least alleviating the aliasing. Uh, and that's what we're going to get into next episode when we talk about table-driven oscillators. And we're going to get into the interesting synth design stuff now that we're getting through some of the theories. So I hope you uh, enjoyed this and uh, can join us next time. Click that subscribe button and I'll see you later.